for the raffle winner, um, um, I was just explaining to Keith that it all goes to scholarships most of the time. Um, anyway, I'm pleased today to introduce our speaker, Keith Maskus. Um, reviewers of his most recent book on the economics of intellectual property called Keith a distinguished author who continues to lead in a field that he helped to create and define. Um, you see his bio up here. He is a sought after lecturer around the world. Last month it was Helsinki, the month before that Krakow. Um, next month he's in Hong Kong, but today he's at Boulder Rotary. <laughs> While his topic today is sanctions in Russia, he is willing to answer questions about other international economic headliners like China and Iran. So get your questions ready. Um, I also want to give a special welcome to Keith's wife, Sue Rehack, who is here with him and with us. Um, she's a lawyer and a court-appointed special advocate for children in Boulder County. Uh, please welcome Professor Maskus to our club. Remember that this was not advanced the slides. You've got to use that. Oh, well, thank you, Karen, and thank you for the uh, invitation. It's great to be here. Um, I do spend a lot of time out of Boulder, but it's always good to be here and, and speaking of whatever. Um, she inferred or, or, or intimated that my specific area of, of interest and in research has always been international trade and innovation and technology, intellectual property. So I know a lot about that, a lot about China and the trade war with China. But today, uh, I thought it would be interesting to, uh, to say a few things about, um, let's see, is she advancing? Okay. Oh. Well, anyway, economic warfare and sanctions, uh, especially, specifically uh, with regard to Russia uh, and the situation in Ukraine. So, um, you're going to be advancing this it's this one right okay great so um, as you uh, surely know uh, had one big slide before this one there we are okay as you surely know uh, very well the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine uh, in 2022 uh, resulted in these very massive economic sanctions I'll be talking about against Russia, some people in Ukraine, certainly some people in Belarus. Um, and uh, that has made them a subject of great interest and in discussion these days. But it, it may uh, interest you to know that there's a really long history of sanctions. And as far as any, anyone can tell, um, the earliest um, published version of, of a description of sanctions was in 432 BC, when according to Aristophanes, the uh, leader of Athens, Pericles, issued this decree stating that the Megarians shall not be on our land, in our market, on the sea, or on the continent. That was a complete trade embargo against uh, a rival uh, city-state, and apparently uh, had a lot to do in precipitating the Peloponnesian War, which you may know about. So, some background for you. Um, there's a lot more we can say about this, but, but economic sanctions have become sort of the go-to diplomatic bit of, uh, of using economic uh, barriers to try to get some other country to change its behavior or um, just to, to express some kind of dissatisfaction with what they're doing. So these sanctions grew rapidly after the 1970s uh, and were, were greatly expanded in what they do. So could have been expanding human rights, seeking compensation for property expropriation in different countries, combating drug cartels. We have extensive sanctions against Venezuela, of course, which has to do with uh, a lot of the, the, the sort of unsatisfactory policies there. Venezuela is essentially a failed state, and that's why there's so many people coming from Venezuela here now. Uh, those sanctions exist in response. Um, so trying to reduce the power of terrorist groups, slowing down nuclear prol proliferation, and, and many others. Um, and these, these now play a central role in U.S. and European Union foreign policy. They really do. Um, so that's kind of the first uh, 
step for what happens. Here are some well-known historical examples before we get to Russia of US-led sanctions, and, and there are many, many others. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the total here in a moment. But you know about all of these. We have had a trade and travel embargo against Cuba since 1960. The idea, of course, was to try to uh, put enough pressure on the Cuban regime that there might actually be regime change, or at least to get them to, to change some of their policies, open up their markets, allow more um, investment in Cuba, whatever it was. That, that, it's fair to say, with a few exceptions, and maybe the Obama administration really has had very little effects. There's been also a trade and tra travel embargo against North Korea since 1950. The idea behind that one uh, was and is to try to slow down North Korean nuclear proliferation. Um, it's not working, it seems. Um, then you probably remember the Olympics boycott in 1980. I think I'll just move beyond that since time is so short. We've had uh, trade investment technology restrictions against Iran uh, from 1984. Uh, they sometimes get in increased in their severity. Sometimes they get pulled back a little bit to try to, to get the Iranians to change their behavior. And I think you all know about the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Partnership uh, Progress on Action that was negotiated in 2015 by the Obama administration. Um, and that led to some relaxation of sanctions against Iran in return for them agreeing to slow down their enrichment of nuclear, of, of, of uranium. But the Trump administration, uh, when they came in, one of the first things they did was uh, to go back on that. So that's in flux, to say the least. Um, it uh, hasn't had a lot of effect, I would say, on, uh, on the Iranian policy. And then the US-China trade war, which I know a lot about and was heavily involved in uh, when I was in Washington. If you want to uh, hear more about that, just let me know. Okay, so have there been any successes? Well, can you? There we are. Uh, there's generally uh, a consensus that the one large element or episode of economic sanctions that may have had a positive impact was um, the restrictions against South Africa and the apartheid regime in the 1980s and early 1990s. Um, that was a wide-ranging uh, set of policies that we can talk about. A lot of that was focused on, on preventing foreign investment from getting into South Africa, uh, both by private decisions in the corporate sector and by public restrictions. And sure enough, it wasn't long after those sanctions were put in place that the regime weakened and then fell. Many, many thought it was going to fail on its own, but, but that's probably the one that uh, is most widely considered to have been a success. Uh, if you're interested, there is this global sanctions database. I'm happy to, uh, to talk more about it if you like. But this is a bunch of economists at Drexel University in, in Philadelphia who try to, 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 to keep up with all of the sanctions imposed around the world. Currently in their database, there are 1,325 sanctions episodes in the data. Um, that's not the total number of sanctions. For example, right now, the number of financial sanctions imposed against Russia, when you put them at the micro level, imposed against individuals and individual firms in Russia is well over 5,000. Um, but episodes, meaning discrete policies <clears throat> in an attempt to try to change some, some foreign restrictions. Well, um, there you are. This is broken down by types of sanctions and many other things. What were the objectives to the extent they can measure them? Were they effective uh, to the extent that you can measure that? That's a hard problem. But here um, are some stylized facts about economic sanctions or what you might call economic warfare. One is that sanctions are increasingly used over time. Um, you know, there's, there are always uh, conflicts going on between nation states. Uh, and even though it seems like there's been a lot of warfare, including especially in the Russia-Ukraine case most recently, the number of major international wars, if you don't count Russia and Ukraine currently, uh, 
has been very small in comparison to prior history. And one argument for sanctions is their one way of substituting that kind of disapprobation for actual going to, to the military stage. So sanctions are certainly increasingly used over time. Uh, the types of sanctions are becoming much more varied. Uh, typically, we think of these as trade barriers, tariffs or embargoes. <clears throat> but it's much more the case now that sanctions have become financial in nature, there are limitations on travel, there are technology restrictions. On, all of those are involved in the Russian case, and I'll mention them as well. Um, I'm trying to move my screen and this screen at the same time. A little confusing here. Okay. <clears throat> The main objectives of recent sanctions have been to change or you know, implement uh, human rights policies to encourage democratization. So really, if you can just see right there, that as far as the Americans and the Europeans are concerned, this is the number one way, the policy uh, program you can try to uh, engage in to get um, changes that are uh, amenable to sort of values in the West. But having said that, the quote unquote success rate of sanctions has fallen since the mid 1990s. It's not too surprising. Early on, say before World War II and up to 1970, sanctions were quite rare. It was clear why they were imposed, what the objective probably was, uh, and typically imposed from a strong state to a small state. Uh, and those things probably were more likely to work than now when you have these proliferating global sanctions that are very complex and very uh, difficult to try to implement and deal with. And so whether they actually work, uh, if you can define what a success rate is, um, it, they seem to be less and less uh, successful over time. So there's a definition of, of economic sanctions. We don't need to say much more about that unless you want to. Economic warfare means taking these sanctions and using them specifically uh, against a perceived real or potential military adversary to try to complement uh, military action if there is that or to substitute for military action to try to avoid that. Clearly in the case of Russia, what the Americans and Europeans are trying to do is not to get involved militarily themselves, but to use these to try to supplement what the, uh, what the Ukrainians are doing on the ground. So what are the main kinds of sanctions? Well, trade boycotts and embargoes. You've had seen many examples of that. Financial restrictions, so taking somebody's, sorry, taking somebody's yacht. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but these yachts are extremely expensive to uh, keep in your dock, and they're all over. They're in Florida, they're in the Caribbean, they're in Italy, they're in uh, Cyprus, and all of these places are spending a whole lot of money to keep these yachts in good working order. Um, so. If you're worried about the, the taxpayer cost of sanctions, there's a good one to worry about. Uh, access restrictions and high technology goods. This is, as far as I think the Americans are concerned now, the number one thing you can do uh, to try to really debilitate somebody's military uh, or economic abilities. Uh, and then, of course, smart sanctions uh, imposed on individuals and enterprises. And there's an individual who has been heavily sanctioned many times. Um, come back to that in a minute. Okay, now the truth is the objectives of particular sanctions programs are not always clear. Uh, in fact, you will rarely hear the American government or the European government, Japanese, Koreans, actually formally and explicitly stating what they're trying to achieve because there's a lot of diplomatic and strategic value in not doing that, not least if it doesn't work, you can say, well, it did work. That's just, that was our objective, whatever you got to. But nevertheless, uh, it's, it's uh, not always clear what's going on. But here are some of the main foreign policy goals. Try to destabilize governments in the hope of regime change. Coerce the target government uh, into changing some kind of an objectionable policy. Punish countries for military aggression. Clearly, what's going on, here we are in... Russia, and to try to deter future undesirable policies and aggressions. Now, if you look at that, um, that has a, a great many dimensions to it, so it can be quite complicated, as I'll uh, illustrate in here in a moment. Um, but the idea here is to try to use uh, 
these kinds of tools uh, to get policy regime change, policy regime change, or just policies changed. Um, there are also, this is what is sometimes not quite as well understood. Many times the objective of a sanctions program are at least as much domestic in the country that's imposing the sanctions as they are in terms of foreign policy. So, just a few examples. You can express outrage on behalf of your own voters. So a good example of this was the very stiff sanctions imposed on China after Tiananmen Square. They didn't last that long, uh, but they certainly sent a signal. Those against the military dictators in Myanmar, which again, another example, that regime is just too entrenched to make much difference with these sanctions. Maybe to prepare your domestic citizens for the potential of armed conflict if it becomes necessary. And then, interestingly enough, foreign sanctions, um, there we are, may be designed to improve economic conditions for domestic business interests. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many uh, studies have been done by economists who actually show that the structure of American or European sanctions imposed on foreign firms actually has the ultimate effect of in increasing business for certain American companies, whether that's in agriculture or in banking or something else. So you, something to, uh, to, to pay attention to if you're interested in this kind of thing. <clears throat> now, conventional wisdom among political scientists and economists who study this is that economic sanctions are generally pretty ineffective in achieving their goals, and I was hinting at that earlier. So you, we could ask, why might sanctions fail to change foreign behavior? Well, several reasons. One is, they just may not be uh, damaging enough to impose significant costs on the target Putin and Russia. Even really high economic costs may not be enough to deter an autocratic leader. And in fact, Kim <coughs> Jong-un in, uh, in North Korea is a great example of this. So is, so is Putin in Russia now. Those target dictators uh, have a lot of ability to manipulate markets in their own economies to the point that they actually benefit themselves from the sanctions. So if you think about what's going on in Russia right now, a lot of, one of the outcomes of, of, of not necessarily the sanctions, but the war itself is that global commodity prices have risen quite a bit. Uh, and that, it, to anybody who owns the agricultural producers in Russia is a benefit. Uh, but it is certainly a benefit to, uh, to, to, to Putin and some of his cronies. You can say the same thing about the oil sector, although that one is much more complicated. So that's uh, an issue. Second, the uh, country like the United States that puts these sanctions in place may not achieve enough cooperation by other potential sanctioning nations. Now, one of the really uh, characteristics or distinctive characteristics of the Russian sanctions now, is that there has been uh, remarkable multilateral international coordination of these sanctions. Um, that, is, that is rare, but it is happening this time. Um, international cooperation is essential uh, in this kind of a context, but it may be hard to achieve for pretty obvious reasons, but I'll say a bit more about the Russian sanctions in that in a minute. Uh, and then other countries who are not involved in sending these sanctions may support the target country, all right, through filling the uh, the trade uh, embargo is circumventing the sanctions. Trade is then diverted instead of destroyed. We're, that's clearly going on in the current situation where Russian exports are down uh, two year, in a two-year period about 15 to 18 percent in real terms. Uh, but it would be much more than that if there weren't markets opening up for them in places like China and India. Pro providing access to alternative financial systems. So. One of the big sanctions, as I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, is, is that Russian banks are no longer avail have, have access to the global US-dominated SWIFT financial uh, system. But the Chinese are trying to develop an alternative payment system for themselves, and that's one way that, that the Russians might be able to avoid some of the financial costs of these sanctions. Okay. And then just a couple of other observations. Sanctions may cement the resolve of the leaders and the populations of target countries. That's uh, possible. Um, in the case of Putin, I think that resolve is kind of unshakable. 
Sanctions may alienate foreign allies, uh, so the Europeans or the Japanese, especially if enforcement that the Americans undertake is extraterritorial. There's a lot of that in the current framework, uh, but the Europeans so far have gone along with it. And they may harm domestic businesses and consumers, like in the United States or Europe. And, and as a first approximation, in the Russian sanctions case, the, uh, the, sanction, the firms in the sanctioning countries that are bearing the largest burden are European firms, considerably more than, uh, say, American firms. Okay. So, sorry about that. When might sanctions work? Well, there is recent research that finds some pretty strong evidence that large-scale sanctions do impose significant costs on their, on their targets, even if they don't re uh, achieve much in the way of regime change. So uh, just to give an example and a, a little illustration of what uh, happens in the chief economist's office of the State Department, if that interests you. Uh, so I was the chief economist uh, a few years ago there. Um, we did a lot of estimation of detailed microeconomics data, uh, trying to see if the sanctions imposed on Russia and some other places in the context of the 2014 invasion of Crimea were having much effect. Now, they didn't change Russian policy at all. Russia is still in Crimea and still trying to keep the eastern part of the Ukraine for themselves. Uh, but it had really substantial and negative impacts on the ability of the targeted firms and individuals to operate. So they paid a heavy cost for it. So that might be what you think of as success, uh, even if you don't get a change in the policy there very much. Now, what characteristics make sanctions more likely to succeed? Well, the sanctioning nations being much larger, larger than the target, that's mostly true in this context. Sanctions are comprehensive and impose long-lasting pain on the elites. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impacts in Russia here. Sanctioning countries have substantial control over uh, access to financial systems. Target may be readily subject to financial crises or default. Russia has defaulted once so far in the context of these sanctions. Um, and there's a lot of international coordination, as I was mentioning. Okay. Oh, and there's political opposition in the target country that may be mobilized. People write about this all the time. Um, it's not doesn't seem to be happening in Russia just because obviously the uh, political suppression in Russia is so dramatic now that uh, it's kind of hard to organize that kind of opposition. But the hope is with these sanctions episodes that you will actually put enough pain on the elites and quasi-elites in the, in the target country that they'll start to reorganize the politics of the country. Okay. So... As I suggested, all of this suggests that designing and implementing a sanctions program is really technical and complex undertaking. All kinds of uh, experts in the government and across governments trying to think through this. It's a big game theory problem with massive uncertainties about how and when the target nation or other countries and firms may react. Um, so, you, as you can imagine, um, in, in, a, in a country that's doing a serious attempt at sanctions, there's all kinds of gaming going on to try to figure out what the best sanctions might be, what are the, what are the sequencing in which these sanctions would happen, uh, and so on. So, that's really quite interesting, I would say, uh, and one of the more interesting things I got a little bit involved in myself. Okay. So, <clears throat> sanctions against Russia. The current sanctions date back, as I was saying a minute ago, to Crimea in 2014. The Obama administration imposed extensive micro-targeted sanctions. So what, did that, what, is, what are micro-sanctions or smart sanctions? It means instead of doing some big macroeconomic trade embargo that inv involves all industries or some financial limitation to try to deal with the, ma excuse me, the macroeconomics, you actually pick individuals and firms in the target country and sanction what they're doing. So you say, you can't have this technology, you can't export to that market, and that kind of thing. Um, freeze your, your yachts and your financial assets. Um, so as I suggested, they are effective at the individual enterprise level, uh, but uh, they did not, in the case of 2014, extend to national trade restrictions or macroeconomic res restrictions against Russia. Uh, and so, in fact, they didn't change Russian behavior at all. Um, so many argue that those sanctions, as 
Oh, okay. I got to stop. So let me go right to just a couple of comments about these sanctions. Um, what are they? Trade embargoes, price cap on Russian oil, a very interesting thing. I'll talk about that if you like in you know, Q&A. Bans on exporting certain technologies, uh, freezes and seizures of Russian government assets. And then the big one is number, sorry, six here. Uh, the Americans and Europeans and the Japanese have, and a couple of other places, have all frozen the access of the Russians to the foreign reserves they have held in those countries. So j between the United States and Europe, 600 billion in Russian foreign reserves are held in, say, the, you know, the, like the Federal Reserve Bank or the, uh, the ECB. Those are frozen. The Russians have no access to them. And in fact, the question has come up what, what to do about it. Uh, and many have suggested using those to try to pay the costs of Ukraine, uh, engaging in this military action, which is a really interesting thing. We'll say more about that if you like. Here are a few impacts on Russia. Uh, I've, I've run out of time, but let me just say the Russian economy is suffering. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it's hard to measure these things, but there was a large fall in Russian real GDP by, by in 2022. Yeah, a little bit of a bounce back this year, but activity is dramatically lower now than it was. Inflation is well over 10% now. And, and many of these multinational firms have left the country. Huge numbers of young, skilled workers have left the country. Um, there are credible reports of near collapse in certain sectors like automobile and aircrafts. Um, and, you know, the Chinese and Indians and others have filled in some of these uh, Russian lost trade and oil revenues, but, uh, but that's a small effect relatively. I'm, I'm not going to say much about how Russia has responded other than to say they've done everything they can to try to keep oil prices high, but that's uh, in terms of their oil revenues. Tremendous reduction, uh, and they're now getting a, a large reduction in government tax revenues. That's causing problems in terms of their budget situation, uh, and it's not clear yet what they're going to do about this. Russia has moved closer to China, Iran, and India, but that's, as I say, not a very promising set of trade partners going forward. I think I will just finish this up because I've taken too much time. How likely is this all to work? Well, we need to know what the U.S. defines success to be. If it means Russia withdraws entirely from Ukraine, I think that's not likely just because of these sanctions. It's going to take a military solution. Um, so far, U.S. and European residents are supporting these sanctions, uh, but we'll see how far that goes. I think you know about the vote in Slovakia a few days ago, maybe suggesting things are changing. Um, and finally, at this point, the jury is out, I would say, regarding whether these sanctions will, sorry, change Russian behavior, or even make the war any shorter. But maybe the way to think about this is that wasn't really the expected outcome. The sanctions are harming Russia. It is an indication that economic warfare has an, an effect, an important effect, but maybe not decisive on the policy. Ultimately, though, this presumably will have some impact on Russian politics. We'll see. I've run too far, so I'm going to stop there, please, and see if there are questions. Yes, we have about seven minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my question involves how do you actually put a sanction into, um, <clears throat> into action? Is that an executive function? Is it just the president? Can the secretary of the treasury make a sanction? Uh, who does the sanctions? <laughs> <laughs> who does them? Uh, it depends on the type of sanctions, of course. But it's, it's a decision made at the executive level in the White House. Uh, the details are left to Treasury or to the Commerce Department uh, or the Defense Department. But the best example is in the Treasury Department, there's an entire office. It's massive, OFAC it's called, which is the one, is the office uh, that decides what these sanctions, the financial sanctions will be, who they're going to be imposed on, over what time period. So that's it. It's a deeply technical thing, but it's done by the executive branch, not Congress. Thank you. We have a question online from uh, Jim Radowski. If you want to unmute yourself, Jim. All right. Does somebody have a question in the room? No, I'm here. Oh, geez. All right. Sorry about that. Just took me a moment to get unmuted. I didn't realize I was muted. 
So my question is, what is the legality of sanctions? In other words, it seems like um, one nation is unilaterally making the decision that it has the authority, power uh, to levy sanctions on another country and, and indeed uh, on individuals as well. Um, you know, these yachts, for example, there must be some sense of a legal limit uh, uh, or we would just uh, perhaps sell the yachts and give the money to Ukraine or, or sink the yachts rather than continue to bear the cost of uh, keeping them in dock. And what about the countries that are being sanctioned? Can't they go to the international court and uh, protest? That is a week-long discussion. <laughs> but uh, so the there are about three sort of international legal regimes that would matter here. One is the World Trade Organization regarding tariff restrictions and so on. Um, but in that context, if you're willing to say in the context of putting your sanctions in place and on the trade side that this is an issue of your own national security, which is always what is claimed, then there's a, basically a blanket exemption from, from uh, uh, WTO rules. Second would be, you mentioned the International Court of Justice. Uh, these seizures are done on a unilateral or, or sometimes cooperative basis, uh, but obviously they are, can be seen as seizures of somebody's asset. Uh, and so there are international courts you can appeal to. But in the Russian case, uh, I don't think they're going to get very far if they do these kinds of uh, court cases for the obvious reason. Um, and then the third has to do with uh, how, how, how is your inter are your international investment assets treated? Because those get seized quite a bit as well. So the Russians have taken a lot of European f f enterprise assets in their own country for themselves. Um, and there are international courts that can deal with that as well. Uh, but it, I would just say in the context of international sanctions that are imposed for clearly uh, military reasons like this one, in the case of Russia, um, all bets are off. There really aren't any rules that would, would, uh, would, would prevail. And the really interesting new thing that you uh, alluded to is what should the West do with all of these assets they've seized. Give them back to Russia? I think that's really unlikely. So as I mentioned the foreign reserves, which is probably worth seven or eight hundred billion dollars by now. Those can and might for too long be freed up uh, to help pay for the military activities of the Ukrainians. I personally would prefer that they get put into some kind of account that will ultimately lead to some kind of new Marshall Plan for the Ukraine and that part of, the, of Europe. Thank you. Um, if I understand sanctions correctly, uh, they may relate to the delivery of certain goods and services or technology uh, from, let's say, United States countries. How is that kind of activity monitored, or is it? And if it's discovered, are there penalties on the U.S. companies? Yeah, so the reason that this office in the Treasury Department I mentioned is so big is that they're monitoring these things very closely. So the Europeans uh, the, in Brussels have similar offices and so on, but let me just give you one example, okay? I, I mentioned briefly that there is a price cap on Russian oil. Uh, if that oil is sold in one of the sanctioning G7 countries, that's U.S., doesn't matter, we don't buy Russian oil, but Europeans did, uh, still do. How do, you, if, how do you enforce a price cap when oil is a global market, right? This is a really interesting question. And the answer is that Europe and the Americans have told the insurance companies that insure the shipping of this oil, uh, and most of them are actually Western shipping or, or insurance companies, that uh, you have to document to us where this oil came from, barrel by barrel, uh, and we'll make sure that it's sold at $60 a barrel, or if it, does, if it gets to a higher price than that, you're gonna, you're gonna pay the, diff the difference, right? You're gonna get fined. So there are deep microeconomic channels under which you can actually make these things work. Uh, as far as circumventing technology sanctions, it's, it's a big, big task. But, you know, if an American company is caught sending high technology semiconductors can be used for military purposes, and I think you may have seen stories like this, 
uh, to Russia, to Belarus, whatever it is, or other places like China now, uh, then they can be fined quite extensively, including having the CEO thrown in jail. I don't, that's rare, but it is in, within the law. It's on. Is it on now? There we go. Well, oh, thank you, Professor Marcus. I appreciate your presentation today to our club. This is very personal to me. I'm born in Finland, and you know, I just visited there in July, and I can tell you that with my father and uncles who fought in the Winter War with the Russians and share an 800-mile border, what's happening in Ukraine is very important to them. Sure. And when I was there in July, the main post office in downtown Helsinki has a Ukrainian flag flying, not the Finnish flag. So that tells you how important it is as they watch what's happening. Right. And it's also affected a lot of the Finnish citizens because, as you can imagine, the Russians spent a lot of money in Helsinki, and they closed that border. So it's also affected the Finns economically at that same case. But thank you again for your good words and understanding of what sanctions mean. And it's been our customary uh, process here at our Boulder Rotary Club that, in honor of your presentation, we uh, present 100 doses of vaccine to the Polio Plus Fund. It's oh, been part of our thing. whole Rotary International program to eradicate polio in the world, and you made a contribution toward that end, and we appreciate that, and we have a certificate in your honor. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you. If you're looking for an opportunity to be outside and do some good, then we have just the project for you. On Saturday, October 7th, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, Boulder Rotary and the Play Boulder Foundation will plant at least eight trees as part of the Marshall Fire Victims Tree Planting. Meet at the Ascent Community Church parking lot, 550 McCassum Boulevard in Louisville. Be sure to dress appropriately for the weather, wear closed-toed shoes, and bring a shovel and gloves if you have them. Call Kathy Olivier to volunteer with her phone number up on the screen. Thank you to the Preserve Planet Earth and the BRC Pop-Ups Committees for co-sponsoring this planting. Hope to see you there. Would you like to catch the last curtain call at one of Boulder's long-standing dinner theater companies? Then join the Boulder Rotary Club night at the Boulder Dinner Theater for a night of fun. There are 30 center stage tickets reserved for Fiddler on the Roof. The tickets include dinner and theater for Wednesday, November 15th at 6 p.m. Hurry, tickets are going fast and seats are limited. If you're interested, please contact Linda Nels at lindanels at gmail.com. Wednesday, November 15th at 6 p.m. at the Boulder Dinner Theater. The Stan Black Award honors someone who has shown a lifetime commitment to offering their time, treasure, and talent in serving the charitable organizations of Boulder County. The award is named after longtime Boulder Rotarian and 1976-77 BRC president, Stan Black. This year's awardee is our own Carol Griever. Carol is a past president of our club, is a member of Boulder County's Business Hall of Fame, has served as a trustee at Naropa University, she is the embodiment of service above self, and this just begins to scratch the surface on her incredible CV. Congrats, Carol, on this well-deserved recognition.
lot coming at us. Slick and targeted marketing, misinformation based on your computer habits and demographics, social media pushing us in all directions. Dan Simons wants to give us some key habits to think about what we see, why we're seeing it, and hopefully not to accept all we're presented with. Dr. Simons is a professor of psychology at the University of Illinois, where he heads the Visual Cognition Laboratory. He's the author of three books and is coming next Friday to talk about his newest book, Nobody's Fool, Why We Get Taken In and What We Can Do About It. This is bound to be a super interesting program. Hope to see you there. Have, Have a great, great weekend. weekend.